Well, good morning, church, and wow, thank God we all made it safely through the storm. We thank God for his protection, and uh, as we are about to start our morning service, we know we're having some internet difficulties, so if you get a little later, fine, but we're here to worship the Lord anyway. And so right now we want to call Minister Rehm, the leaders in our first congregational. So stand by as he comes. Well, praise the Lord, glory to God in the highest. Jesus is our shelter in the time of storm. We're so delighted to be in the house of the Lord this morning. If you have a hymn book at home, 353, we'll sing it all together for the glory of the Lord. The Lord, our rock, in Him we hide, a shelter in the time of Thank you, thank you so much, Brother Strap. Our next hymn is To God Be the Glory, Great Things He Hath Done. And we ought to give God the glory and the praise. It is only He who has kept us. It's only He who has held us. It's only He who has protected us through all of these various different situations. Let's sing together To God Be the Glory. To God be the glory, great things He hath done. Lord. 
sin and open the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he had done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood. To every believer, the promise of God. The mindless offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon received. Praise the Lord. Hear his voice, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. Great things he has taught us, great things he has done. Great our rejoicing. What a beautiful hymn we sing the third and last together. Things he had taught us, great things he had done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord. Amen. The Bible says in Psalms 126 verse 3, The Lord has done great things, therefore we ought to be glad. And we thank God for him spending our lives again from the storm. And of course we have another storm, uh, COVID-19 to deal with. And so we pray that all of you will continue to be safe. We know there was a spike uh, over the past few days. I mean, uh, it's really went very high. And uh, we just need to pray for safety. I guess that it all started with the folks who went to the States. And they came back and of course it's running like wildfire so we ask you to just uh, to be cautioned and to take necessary um, necessary measures that the government has put in place washing your hands and wearing your masks and doing those other stuff that's to limit the flow and uh, the spread of this disease but we know that god is still in control and god knew that it was going to happen before the world was created so nothing takes him by surprise and so we want you to continue to uh, serve him and live for him and as a result of this, let's draw close to them. Well, uh, we have some folks who are, who are not doing well among us. We want you to pray for them. And also remember to pray for our essential workers. All the police officers, defense force officers, the nurses, those who work in the food stores and business places. Let's remember to pray for all of them. Because again, they are really in the forefront of this uh, virus. But we know that God, like I said, is in control. He is our ultimate protector. We, uh, we had a wedding this past week here at the church. Uh, of course, but Max and his wife got married here. And so we want you to be much in prayer for them and much in prayer for all the married folks and all of you who are watching by way of YouTube. We pray that somehow we'll be able to join back up in fellowship. We were having a great time. The crowd was growing. And then all of a sudden, bang, the spread start. And we went back to normal again. So we're here. That's to bring to you, by God's grace, the service here. And we want you to continue just to pray for all of us. Pray for our pastor as he brings forth the word and pray for him as he lead this congregation. Pray for Brother Kwame and pray for Brother Ray, all the deacons. Pray for all of us as leaders that we will continue to be faithful to the Lord and as we continue to serve him here at this local assembly. Right now we want to ask Brother Ray to come back to lead us in another song. And then of course right after that we will hear from our pastor for this morning message. Brother Ray. Amen. We'll sing our final congregation this morning. And so glad that you're singing along with us. 
And uh, when we all get to heaven, and well, hey, this won't be like this forever. We'll all leave this world and get to heaven. That's going to be rejoicing. Sing it together. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansion bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. serving the Lord through uh, the media and you allowing God to use them for the honor and glory of his name. This morning I'd like to divert a little bit seeing that the storm has passed by and uh, boy God has been good to us. Uh, he kept us. Uh, we watch over. We, we call, I mean I hate to say it in the use of this expression, but we call that that storm, that one was a baby one. That, that, that was okay. We enjoyed that baby. Uh, and if all the storms were like that, oh boy, we, we feel good about that because that one, I guess, in the anticipation of what has transpired already with Dorian, we were, we, you know, we were kind of built up to, hey, this thing could be rough and rugged, and the truth is it could have been, but God in His wisdom and in His mercy uh, permitted it to pass by, and as far as I know, our islands have been virtually unscathed, and um, it, it has been just, just beautiful. Uh, how God has delivered us and uh, we need to pray for as it goes up the coast of Florida uh, again that God's hand of protection will be upon them and uh, and then again of course we need much be much in prayer for our situation um, we have the um, a spike that has taken place in our country we now have over 500 folk that have um, been uh, uh, discovered to have COVID-19 and uh, many are still recovering so we, we ask that you pray for our nation as we pray for all the nations of the world, all our friends, all our loved ones. And uh, when it's at home, it's very close and uh, it, it, it is something that is sensitive to us. Um, this morning I, I want to divert from my subject would have been uh, Psalm 23, but I'm going to divert a little bit and speak on the subject, the lessons of life in the storms of life. And uh, they tell us that there's another hurricane headed this direction where we're praying God will deliver us again as he has delivered us before. And um, 
I tell you what, let's let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God for his wisdom and his presence. Father, we are thankful for your love. We're thankful for your blessings. Lord, you are God of gods, Lord of lords, King of kings. And I'm thankful that in your sovereignty, you have permitted us to be spared during this time. I pray that each one of us may truly uh, turn our hearts to you, uh, get embedded in you, be strengthened by you, be encouraged by you, and become faithful to you. I pray that you bless the listeners of your word today, especially those that are members of our church, our congregation, our friends, and then our sister churches and friends and preachers uh, around the globe, and those that are preaching the truth in spirit and in truth. Uh, I pray that God that you would honor your name, lift up your name, exalt yourself through the ministry of the word. I pray for anybody listening today that's unsaved, they would come to know Jesus Christ before it's eternally too late. Now, Lord, bless your word to our hearts today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, our scripture text will be taken from the book of Matthew, Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 8. And so we're excited about that and we're looking at what God is going to say through this verse. It is an amazing, amazing chapter and we, look, we believe God's going to say some things that are very, very interesting this morning. Well, um, lessons of life in the storms of life. Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 to 27, the scripture says, And when he had entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, in, a, in so much that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us. We perish. I can hear the anxiety in their uh, voices. Verse 26. And he said unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Lessons of life in the storms of life. Again, I want to say I am thankful here, especially in the Bahamas, how we have been spared from a catastrophic hurricane. And uh, this storm, by the way, the name was Isaias. Isaias. And the name means Isaiah. Jehovah is salvation. Now, I believe that I have heard so much about storms this past week that that perhaps was what has been playing on my heart as I was meditating on the Word of God and I became impressed with giving a message on the lessons of life and the storms of life. And just go by, by way of, of introduction, historically when storms were named, they were all named after women. <laughs> now I don't know why, but I guess they thought women were wicked. And I guess you could call that uh, gender inequality. And from 19... 53 until 1979, uh, they, the names were borrowed from wives and girlfriends and disliked public figures. And it said that the U.S. used a system that only used female names. It is said that Roxy Bolton and some other women, you know, they campaigned. And eventually in 1979, the U.S. changed and started naming men's names in addition to the women's names according to history.com uh, you know um, it is interesting as we look at the list of storms that are projected for this year the names you in may it is said that um, from actually storms began really uh, is designated from storm time is from june 1st to november 30th but um in May this year, there were two storms, Arthur and Bertha. They already occurred. And then, of course, after that was Cristobal, then Dolly, then Edward, Faith, Gonzalo, Hannah, Isaias, Isa, Isaias. Oh, man, how are you pronounce that one? That's the one that we just passed this. Isaias. Josephine. Kyle, Laura, 
Marco, Nana, Omar, Paulette, Renee, Sally, Teddy, Vicky, and Wilfred. They're the names the next set of designated storms for, for the year. But let's pay particular attention now to our text. Verse number 23, it says, And uh, when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. Now, three Gospels report about Jesus being involved with the disciples in a storm, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And there are some distinctions among them. And we'll tackle those, I guess, some subsequent message. But the first, one, first lesson I think we need to learn about lessons of life in the storms of life is number one, in verse number 23. And when he was added into a ship, his disciples followed him. Now I think that's very important. It needs to be understood that following Christ does not mean that you will not have storms. We are not exempted because we are Christians. In Matthew chapter 7, you will read in the ending portion of Matthew 7, where Jesus gives the story in verse 24, and he says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these things of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And if you listen to what Christ says, and do what Christ says, he says, you like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And he said in verse 25, And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And then he said, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, that is, you don't follow what I say Christ says, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And then in verse 26, 27 he says, And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Now what's he saying? He said, listen, when you realize in life, everything is dependent upon people doing according to what my word says. He said, if you follow my word, Man, the rain is going to descend. The floods are going to come up. The winds are going to blow. And they're going to beat on your house. But if you follow my word, you'll stand. And then he says, for those who are not listening, that's a person that is unsaved. That's a person that is not a Christian. That's a person that refuses to follow the words of God. Guess what happens with them? They also have uh, a rain that descends. They also have winds that blow. They also have floods that come up. Listen to me. Not because you are saved means you are exempted. The saved and the unsaved are uh, each one will experience floods and rain and winds. Each one will experience storms. These disciples were not outside of the will of God. They were not following the devil. But at the same time, the scripture says they were following Christ when they came into the storm. Wow. Sometimes we have a thing in our heads that says, you know what? Boy, I'm going to follow Jesus and, and nothing is ever going to go wrong. Well, let's look at what transpired here. I, I like how the scriptures emphasize following Christ, especially in, my, in our text, Matthew chapter 8, verse 19. Scripture says, and certain, a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He said, You willing to follow me? I don't have a house to lay in. I don't have a pillar to lay my head on. You willing to follow me? And then we see in verse number 22, But Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their dead. So, boy, that's a powerful statement. Look at verse 20. And Jesus said, uh, well, we'll but, be but back up right there, verse number 22. Isn't it amazing that following Christ, as they followed the Lord Jesus Christ, these disciples ended up in trouble, in a storm? That's amazing. 
These disciples, by the way, were in the will of God. They're following Christ. Following Christ. By the way, hello, would you believe this? They were following Christ after being commanded by Christ and being obedient to his command. Verse number 18. Now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandments to depart and to the other side. So there's a crowd of people. I mean, he's been doing work all day. He's been healing this one and healing the next one. And uh, he saw the big crowds come. He said, disciples, go. He didn't say, you guys come with me, please. He gave a commandment to depart on the other side. You know, when you look, when you look at it, there are so many various types of storms that come into our life. And mer metaphorically, I guess, speaking, when we talk about storms, we're talking about some pressure, sometimes tragedy, sometimes life-changing situations that take place in our lives. There are financial storms. People are going through that right now, especially with COVID. They have no jobs, they've lost their jobs, and they're trying to figure, where am I gonna get the next bit of money from? I mean, how, is, how are we gonna make it? No job, no money. So there are financial storms that people are going through right now. There's physical storms. Physical storms, somebody may have gotten a report that says, uh, you have a terminal illness, that is, um, cancer or whatever, HIV. You think about the, you know, folk getting old and strokes and blindness and different things wrong with their bodies. They tell us that when it comes down to physical illness, that physical storms or tragedies, uh, the most devastating of them all is death, the death of a loved one. And then, you know, in these physical things we have sexual abuse and rape and we could go on and on and on psychological storms some of them in the family you're dealing with rebellious children uh during covid uh 19 uh you're talking about getting sick oh boy psychologically what does it do to your mind i was speaking with a friend uh, recently and uh he said folks were telling him uh, this covid that he has was it was um, was a flu and he said, no, no, what he has, he knows is not a flu. He's eating certain things, he's practicing certain things. And he said, it's, it's not a flu. He said, the, the dizziness that I have, uh, and the, the smell that I can't smell, and the taste that I can't taste, he said, he knows it's not a, 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 a flu. So I'm, I'm asking, how's your mind? How how you focus? And of course, he's focused on the Lord trying to allow the Lord to work in his life in a special way. Uh, but think about it psychologically if you were told that you had COVID. Psychological storms. And then to be sick during this time with COVID and in the hospital. Now that's something, you know, no one can visit you. What a lonely zone to be in. And then to, to die during this COVID. And right now, they tell us only five people are allowed to, to attend a funeral. Well, come on now. Some people have more than five children. I mean, hey, that's, that's a stress. That's a strain. That's a psychological storm. You know, in one sense, it's nice to know when the storm is coming and from what direction so you can prepare, you know. During this uh, ICS, this, oh boy, I'm trying to pronounce that name over and over and over. That name keeps on tripping me up. During the time that this storm came, they were telling us it's coming in this direction, it's coming in the next direction. Uh, and we were getting prepared. East side, east side, east side, east side, yes. <laughs> Isaias. Isaias. Isa, yes. Oh boy. They were telling us, get ready for Isaias. Yes. And I'm like, okay, all right. But it's good to have such news that, you know, you can get prepared. It's this amount of speed. It is traveling in this amount, this direction. And it's going to arrive at this particular time. Well, that's a lot of preparation we have. That chance, to, in one sense, it's nice to know when the storm is coming. 
But when you get the news that your mate who just left home and you just talk to him or her and you now somebody else comes by and says to you, um, um, uh, your mate is dead. Say what? A shocking news. Um, that, hey, they, there are various ty types of storms. Your baby daddy was just shot. He's dead. The accident has just crippled your, your best friend and they are crippled for life. Shocking, unexpected storms. Even when you're following the Lord. Now, notice in verse number 24 in Matthew chapter 8. And behold, in verse 23, they followed the, him. In verse 24, and behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea. And then, wow. Bible says, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. So what we're saying, we're trying to show you that even if you follow Jesus Christ and you're following him in the will of God, there can still be storms in your life. Variety of storms, financial storms, physical storms, um, psychological storms that can take place in your life. Following Christ does not exempt us from having storms in our lives. They say concerning storms that you're either getting ready to get into one or you've just gotten out of one. Verse 24, the second lesson that needs to be learned. The storm reveals to us our personal way of operation in life. Storms reveal to us our personal way of operation in life. You know, when you really boil down, boil down, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing that takes place. I think it was Warren Buffett, the millionaire, who said that um, not until the tide goes out, you realize who was swimming naked. In other words, many times when the storms of life take place in our life, they reveal to us exactly where we are in relationship to God and in relationship to ourselves. Do you realize that most people's spending habits do not change even though there is a storm? It's still doing the same thing. Still the same philosophy prevails. Storms reveal to us our personal way of operation in our lives. Now, some Christians operate by the world standard in the storm. A storm comes in their marriage and hey, Christian says, hey, uh, hey, I'm going to operate. I'm going to operate the way the world operates. I'm going to opt out for a divorce. I've got a marriage storm, so I'm getting out of here according to the way the world operates. And then there are those Christians. They're going through the pain and the suffering. And, uh, you know, their baby just died. Um, their family was killed. And, and uh, their body is wrapped. And they still say, I'll praise the Lord. I'll give him glory. I'll give him honor. <laughs> then there are others who just said, hey, they just killed my cousin. And I'm going to pay somebody to kill them. So we got Christians, during the storm, it reveals to us our personal way of operation in life. And during that storm, it can, it can tell us whether we're operating according to the Bible or we've been operating according to the world. Like I said, a marriage storm, folk want to opt out. Then you have where children die, you lose your business, your body is rocked with pain and disease, and you still operate for the glory of God. That's what Job did. That's exactly what Job did. In the midst of his storm, all of his children were killed. His business was lost. His health was gone. And yet the Bible says Job worshipped the Lord. Huh. 
You read, take some time to read Job chapter 1. That's an amazing chapter. Paul, in the midst of his storm, he said, listen, they're going to put me to death, but for me to live is Christ. To die is gain. How was he living his life? The storm of death was coming. But guess what he was saying? According to what Paul is saying, he's saying, listen, I'm not going to operate about death the way the world operates on death. I'm not going to go through all that fear and all that. And my mind is set on Christ. For me to die is gain. Woo. These disciples, what did they do? They were in the midst of the storm. In verse 24, behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us. We perish. His disciples, I think, opted to do the normal thing <coughs> that most people do. They prepare themselves physically, which is not bad. You need to do that. But then, you know, most people are just operate and they turn to God in the emergency zone. So I can see these guys, the storm is coming, water is coming in on the boat, waves are, are riven, risen up, and they're so big, so huge. Verse 24 says that in so much that the ship was covered with the waves. So you see that ship going up, tossed, and you see it coming down, and from around, you look around, all you see is the waves up in the air, and you, can, you cannot even see the ship from the shore, and it's a tremendous storm. The cypress, as the water lands on that ship, they get in their buckets, I can see them trying to bail out, bail out, bail out, bail out. They're bailing, they're pushing water out left, right, and center. And then they come to a point, that they, uh, they said, they run to Jesus and said, Lord, hey, Lord, save us, we perish. In other words, we're gonna die. You know, in our world today, what we have is too much religious, um, religiosity. People that are, have no relationship with Christ. Uh, not a true relationship that changes their lives. Now, I realize that when the heavy duty storms are coming into the Bahamas, I don't know if this happens in all nations, but as that storm begins to bear down on us, have you ever listened to the, the news reports? Have you ever listened to the music during that time? The music changes. Even the, the, the neighbors know wild partying and go, stuff going on. Everybody's locked in the home and they're solemn because this thing is coming. It's packing winds of a hundred something miles an hour and people are solemn. And they play all kind of religious music. Guess what? Till the storm passes by. Yeah. We're just religious. No true relationship with the Lord. Yeah, have you ever seen some folk at, at funerals? After the funeral, I mean, they, all the crying that went forth during the funeral, and then after the funeral is over, they have a repast. And what are they doing? Drinking liquor, yeah. partying. Uh -huh. These people don't know Christ. No. They don't have a personal relationship with Christ. They're trying to work themselves around and in through the circumstance, the situation that they've been in, that storm that they're in. Question, are you like Job or are you like his wife? Job was the one that says, um, naked came I into the world and naked shall I leave. Um, God, the Lord giveth, the Lord take it away. He said, I'm worshiping you, Lord. I just lost my, all my children. I just lost all my money. I just lost my health. I lost it all. And he says, Lord, I worship you. Woo! That's the person that that storm showed who he really was. But it also showed who his wife really was. She looked at him. She said, this can't be right. And I'm sure she's thinking about him emotionally. But she, in her mind, this can't be right. Job, just curse God and die. So she's not looking at it from God's viewpoint or anything. But Job is looking at it. And he sees that, um, um, hey, you know what? God is still on the throne. Israel was led by God's pillar of cloud in the day and the pillar of fire by night. 
And God leading them brought them to no water situations. That's what he did. He brought them to no water situations. And guess what they did? They complained. They complained. You say, wait a minute. You mean the great miracles that God did through the nation of Israel, for the nation of Israel, they still complain? Yes, they complain. But let me tell you one of the reasons why they complain. In the book of Exodus, chapter number 12, there's an interesting verse of scripture. And I think it's nice that I, I, I should read that for you. Exodus, chapter number 12. When Israel was leaving out of Egypt, there is a group that went with them. In Exodus chapter 12, and we see in verse 37, the Bible says, And Reuben of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkoth, uh, about 600,000 on foot that were men beside children. This is the final leg of all them, the thousands that are coming out of Egypt. Now notice verse 38. This is very powerful. And a mixed multitude went up also with them. See, there's a lot of folk, they get caught up in religiosity. They're in church, but they're not really saved. They're religious, but they're lost. They are the mixed multitude, and they operate from the basis of themselves, just like the world. They say they're Christians, they say they're saved, they say they've been born again, but they're a mixed multitude. They've never been saved. Now, later on, you find in the book of Hebrews, God says something about the mixed multitudes. Let me turn there, Hebrews chapter number 4, and there's an interesting verse, uh, but again, verse number 1. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached, Listen to this now. The word preached did not profit them. Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So this group came up because they saw the miracles. They came up because they saw what was taking place was exciting. And they said, you know what? Man, yeah, I know Moses did that, but I really ain't believe in God that way. And so guess what they did? They just joined the group and they left out with Israel and they caused the majority of the trouble as Israel went through the wilderness. Mixed multitudes have no problem, listen to me. During the storm, hear me now, the mixed multitude have no problem with stealing God's tithe. You know, the storm takes place and I'm saying to my heart, Lord, I, I, I want to give to you, I want to be faithful. But the mixed multitude the one that's just religious, well, they can care a lot, care less. They focus on themselves, for themselves. And they have no need to be involved in that which is spiritual because they are the mixed multitude. They are interested in getting the gospel out. They are the mixed multitude. They can care less. Mixed multitude. Always lose, however, in the end, because guess what happened to them? Their carcasses always fall in the wilderness. Always fall in the wilderness. How are you in the storm? How are you in the storm called COVID-19? Are you focusing on how to give glory to God? Or are you operating just like everybody else? Are you complaining about the politics? Are you complaining about... Uh, uh, what what the, uh, the newspapers are saying, what society is saying. Are you caught up in that? Or are you spending more time in prayer? Has your prayer life increased or has your prayer life decreased? The mixed multitude, and I was praying in the first place. So COVID comes in, it doesn't motivate them to pray. They don't know we're praying. They only complain, and that's what they continue to do. They continue to complain. The mixed multitude. Um, the mixed multitude, they're going to eat more food. They're gonna, not going to spend more time fasting. Hey, hey, the, 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 the one that's fixed on Christ says, you know what? I need discipline with the food. And sometimes I need to take a break and have a fast before God. 
So God can work in my life. The mixed multitude, they're more feeding from, from the, 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 the TV than feeding from the Bible. The mixed multitude, they are more interested in complaining than in praising. Question, are you operating like the mixed multitude or are you operating like those who are truly men and women of faith? Does this storm reveal where you are personally, how you're operating? The storm reveals our personal way of operation. Like the disciples, we turn to Christ in our relationship with him when there's nothing else to turn to. They couldn't, they couldn't bail the water out anymore. So finally they're going to say, Oh Jesus, please help us. Now, nothing wrong with them bailing the water out. But my word, the minute that, that storm started to come, the first person they should have gone to was the one that they had a relationship with. And it should have been Jesus. Okay? Should have been Jesus. Thirdly, the magnitude of the storm reveals the magnitude of Christ's power. Job's children, his money, his health, his wife, all of it, Satan actually instigated all of it. And the storm was Satan's operation by God's permission. Satan's operation by God's permission. The disciples were in a storm. As a matter of fact, when you look at the information on the storm, you look in verse number 24, and behold, there arose a great tempest. Now that word for tempest is the Greek word seismos. And it means an earthquake. It means a life-shattering event. Um, a seismometer is an instrument that responds um, to the ground, the ground's motion, such as earthquakes, volcanoes, um, explosions. This size, that's where we get that word from, seismos. This eruption, this great tempest was an earthquake. It refers to violent waves that were very high so high that they hid the boat from the normal eyes. Job, there will be great deliverance because you have a great storm. The greater the storm, the magnitude of the storm reveals the magnitude of Christ's power. I'm speaking to Job today. If you are in a situation that there seems to be no coming back from, then you're just like Job. Your situation is very difficult. It is very tough. It is seismous. It is a great tempest. It's like a violent earthquake. That's what the disciples experience in that water. In verse 24, behold, there arose a great seismic tempest in the sea insomuch that the ship was covered with waves but he was asleep I don't know your situation today but I know the greater your situation the greater the opportunity for Christ to manifest himself and to work in your life and you may seem that it may seem that there's no way out but I assure you that in your storm Christ will be there great and powerful and there is a way out even if he has to bring you through and uh, to the other side there is a way out because of Christ fourthly quickly uh, the storm teaches us that Christ goes to sleep because why he is humanly tired at this time the Bible says and behold verse 24 there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Humanly tired. Now remember, Christ was 100% God and 100% man. He was the God-man. 
The scripture says in Hebrews 4, verse 10, For we have not a high priest that could not, you know, God was not tempted with all the temptations like we have. He was tempted just like we are, but yet without sin. That's what our high priest is all about. He was tired. You go to Matthew chapter 8, you see him um, that he was healing uh, the leper, put forth his hand in verse 3, and he healed the leper. You come to verse number 5 in Matthew chapter 8, you see him um, healing the centurion's son. You see him going and healing uh, Peter's uh, mother-in-law and then you see in verse 16 he's casting out devils and uh, this great multitude in verse 17 that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah uh, the prophet saying himself took our infirmities and bear our sicknesses and so he's been healing people all day he commands his disciples get in the boat let's go cross on the other side and he gets in the boat and guess what he is tired for we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points like as we are, tempted yet without sin. You know, have you ever been that tired, humanly speaking? Go sleep in the midst of a storm. Somebody said, man, he had to wait, he had to wait. I think I've been there already. I, I know about that. I was flying a plane one time from, coming from Nassau, going into Turks and Caicos Islands. I can't remember where I was going into Grand Turk. I almost believe I was going into um, Provo, Providentialis. And uh, that, that was hour, two hour flight somewhere. It was a small plane. There was lightning, there was thundering, and that plane was getting tossed left, right, and center. But I was tired, and I was sleeping. And every, car, every now and again, I would wake, and I would see lightning, and I would feel the plane swing, and, 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 and sway in the air. Finally, plane landed on the ground and we came out and I was still sleeping and they pulled me out. They said, I can't, we can't believe it. In the midst of all that thunder and, and lightning, we all were dying in the plane and you were sleeping, mister. <laughs> I can just barely remember seeing the lightning. I can I remember the plane going this way and going that way and I was sleeping. Yes, I was tired. I was tired. And I can understand a little bit here how Jesus was sleeping. With these waves, the Bible says that the ship was covered with the waves. Come on. But he was asleep. Now, you know, sometimes in life, um, it, it seems to us that God is asleep. Have you ever been in those things? You see a couple of things here mentioned in, in, in Matthew 8, look at verse 10. But when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them uh, that followed, Verily I said to you, I have not found so great faith. Verse number 18, Matthew 8, verse 18. Now when Jesus saw the a great multitude, then in verse number 24, and behold, there arose, a, a, a great tempest. And then in verse number 26, and he said unto them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was great calm. <laughs> See, a lot of times in life we go through some situations, sometimes it seems that God is asleep. But may I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, God is never asleep. He's really awake at all times. He's operating. He's doing, he's doing what he needs to do. He has charge. He has control. Nothing is taking place out of control. He has sovereignty in all of this. And I guess that's what blows people's mind. And so quickly, we go to number five. The fifth thing I want to share here, lessons in the life, uh, in, in life about the storm, is storms bring out our fears. Look, in, <laughs> look at verse number 26 again. And I guess this connects with verse 25. And verse 25 says, And the disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us! We perish! They were saying, We're going to die. If you don't do something, Lord, we're going to die. And he said unto them, Why are ye? What? Fearful. 
Why are ye fearful? Woo! Now think on that. The storm brings out our fears. If you got a piece of fear in you, it's going to come out in the storm. Whatever your situation is, it's going to come out. Number one fear, of course, everybody is death. But the truth of the matter is, there's a resurrection. When you see a man like Paul overcame the number one fear and said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's a man that has victory over his number one fear, over man's number one fear. Now they tell us that there are three other fears that men have. Rejection, men fear rejection. That's the reason why some guys, when they make a proposal to a girl, if that girl turns them down and says, you know, well, um, you know, I only, I only like you as a friend. That fella loses it all and like in his life, he's never gonna ask another girl again. The fear of rejection. <laughs> and uh, we know about that man. Then there's the fear of, for men, the fear of irrelevance, you know. Um, you, you're not needed, you know, you're irrelevant. What you say, don't come. And uh, they say a lot of folk have unhealed wounds of irrelevance. And then the fear of disappointment. Uh, they're expecting uh, to do something great and outstanding and uh, uh, you know maybe get some things together and they want to make sure that it's going to be just a great occasion maybe something for some mate or something for somebody that is outstanding and then you present that thing that you work so hard for to get for that person and then guess what happened the person says you know I don't want that and there's what is called disappointment you know, storms bring out our fears. Now here's the question. What is keeping you up late in the night? Are there fears that you're disturbed with? Things that are troubling your mind? Over and over, you're going over and over and over and over and over and the night you can't sleep properly because you have these fears. Wow. Storms bring out our fears. What is it? that you're troubled with. Quickly and lastly, I guess we'll stop right here, is um, the fact that the Lord has his way in the storm. Now despite all the storms that take place in life, nothing, again, may I stress this, nothing can take place, no storm can take place without the permission of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Did you not hear what the disciples said? In verse number 26, and he said unto them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? This is Matthew 8. Then he arose, rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Now notice verse 27. But the man marveled, saying, What manner of man is this? And even the winds and the sea obey him. Hey, hello, the Lord had his way in the storm. The Lord controlled the sea. The Lord control. what kind of man controls the wind? Let me tell you something. No storm, no wind can just decide, oh, I'm gonna go to the Bahamas. You know what, uh, I like landfall there. No, 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 that storm, that wind must have permission by our sovereign God, our sovereign Christ to go where it goes. Amen. To accomplish what it accomplishes. It must have permission. Nahum chapter 1 is an interesting verse. In verse number 3, the Bible says, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. And the clouds are the dust of his feet. The Lord hath his way in the storm, says Nahum chapter 1, verse 3. So when the breeze blows, 
when a roof goes, and I hate to tell people this, and when uh, the waters are pouring, let me tell you something. The sovereign God, may we may, we may we never understand all that is entailed with it, but we believe our sovereign God controls the wind and controls the sea. The disciples came to understand that. They said, what manner of man is this? That even the wind, all the howling, all the 100 miles an hour, 200 miles an hour, 300 miles an hour, 400 miles an hour, the wind, he controls it. And the sea, the waves are risen up 20, 30 feet. They obey him. And then when he's ready, he speaks. Our sovereign Lord speaks. And then there's calm. Calm. And so we see in verse number 26 where it says, Then he rose, rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. The Lord had his way in the storm. If you live through the storm, you know it is all designed for you to be drawn closer to the Lord. You're living in COVID. It's designed by God to teach you and to teach me. First of all, we don't run things. God does. Amen. If there's one thing COVID should teach all of us, that things could change just like that. That's right. That's right. In a second, in a moment. And I know the leaders of the lands, of various lands and around the world are thinking, oh, we, 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 we don't get this. We are just under control. If they don't get it to God, <laughs> Ain't no control. And if God doesn't control it, it won't be controlled. He's teaching all of them, I'm God. And there are people that are dying in the meanwhile because they can't believe. They, they just don't believe. And they, you know, their situation. Is, are others who are dying in faith because they're getting straight to the other side. God's still bringing them to the other side. And when he said to this, to this man here, his disciples followed him. And they're following Christ. And they're going to die, and they're going to the other side. And they're going to be like Paul, and they're going to say, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. So there's no fear of the big enemy death. They recognize that the Lord has his way in the storm. He's going to bring it through the storm. One way or the other. So we could relax, we could prepare, we could do a lot of things. But where's our faith? in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad he was in that boat. I'm glad those disciples looked at that and they realized, you know what? I got too much fear. I need faith. And that's what this chapter is all about. You and I ought to be building our lives in such a way that we ought to be deepening our faith. Let me just give you that one portion and we close with that. Deepening your faith, that's one of the lessons for the storm, being in the storm. Deepening your faith in Christ, the all-powerful one. He controls the storms. He controls COVID-19. No matter what you do, you really aren't in charge. God is saying, I could turn the world upside down in a minute. So what? Let us as Christians deepen our faith. It's not about where you got enough food. It is what is your relationship with the Lord. It's not about how much money you got and what job you got. Your security is not in that. Your security is in your relationship with the Lord. For your God shall supply all your needs. If he doesn't, get rid of him and get on God who can do it. But don't anchor your faith. In the material things of this life. Do not anchor your faith in what is taking place by what you see. Anchor your faith in Jesus Christ. Faith, substance of things, hope for, the evidence of things not seen. I've seen God at work. Faith, my faith needs to be anchored in Him and I need to trust Him. And so during COVID time, I should be praying more. I should be getting into the Word of God more. Hey, that's what a real, genuine Christian learns to do in the midst of the storm. You run to Jesus! Help me, Jesus! As we die! Now, 
for those of you that have never been saved, I hope that you will hear this message and recognize that everything was designed by God to bring you to a saving knowledge of himself. He died on the cross. He paid your debt. You're a sinner on your way to hell. And without repentance, you die and go to hell. You're a sinner on your way to hell. Without repentance, you die you go to hell. Jesus Christ bore all of our sins on that cross. We were away from God. We were wicked in the heart. And God wants to change our lives. And by grace, he said, you reach out to him in faith. He'll save you. He'll forgive you. He'll cleanse you. He'll change your whole life. And then you wouldn't have to worry. Am I going to die? Yeah, you're going to die. But guess what? Absent from the body. Present with the Lord. For me to live is Christ. To die is gain. How? Why? How did get to that point? Because you repent of your sins, you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you got forgiveness, and He gives you that peace. He brought peace. And there was great calm, calm, calm. Are you calm today? Do you need Christ in your life? You could never be calm. Things could look good on the outside, but not be calm on the inside till you give your life to Jesus Christ. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the storms of life. Thank you for lessons to be learned in the storms of life. Help us to move forward and to give you honor and glory and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.